welcome everyone to the um, latest uh, of our webinars. Uh, I'm Tony Roskilly from uh, Durham University, and uh, this is, event is organized by the EPSRC network uh, H2 uh, for hydrogen fuel transportation, which I lead. This is uh, part of a series of events looking at different aspects of hydrogen research in the transport sector. This week, uh, we're on the subject of hydrogen policy and economics. This session is uh, um, uh, being recorded and will be uploaded onto the Net Zero website and the Durham Energy Institute uh, YouTube channel uh, within the next week. Um, links will be posted in the, in the chat as well shortly. Many thanks for your support and interest in this area. Do get in touch with, uh, if there are any other suggestions or feedback that you can give us in terms of the seminar speakers, subjects, etc. And if you're not already on the late, our mailing list, please uh, do add yourself. So our speaker is Dr. Uh, Bob Moran from the Department for Transport. He is head of environment strategy at UK's Department of Transport and has previously worked for the UK's Office for Low Emission Vehicles. That's a, a cross-governmental uh, policy unit working to position the UK as the global leader in the design, development, manufacture and deployment of zero emission vehicles and associated uh, technology. Uh, Bob holds a PhD in biomechanical engineering from Edinburgh University. So uh, Bob, over to you. Thank you ever so much, Tony. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, and thanks to the network for inviting me to, to come and talk to you today. Uh, I'm going to try and give you a kind of transport decarbonisation and hydrogen perspective, uh, looking unashamedly at the transport decarbonisation plan that we published recently, uh, and the hydrogen strategy as well. But I'm anticipating an awful lot of questions from you, uh, and I hope that they will be challenging, but I also hope you'll be able to answer them. I'm just going to talk today, I don't have any slides, it certainly couldn't compete with the fantastic network H2 backgrounds that we can see. Uh, on display. So hopefully I'll be able to, to, to keep you uh, uh, keep your attention. Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned then, so we're about a month on from the hydrogen strategy publication and two months on now from the uh, transport decarbonisation plan, which was published in, in July. And what ministers uh, have described as our green print, really, for decarbonisation. Now things are never things are never stable for too long. So the minister responsible for that uh, left yesterday and has moved to the Home Office. So we've got a new minister that we're getting to get into grips with today. Uh, so I'm looking forward to bringing her up to speed uh, with, with where we've got to uh, and, what's looking, and what we've got on, uh, you know, in the, in the immediate future. Um, broadly speaking, I think ministers uh, and, and the team here at DFT and across government, are, we're still pretty pleased with the, with the publication of the plan and the content. Uh, we're delighted to have got it published ahead of COP26, which is quite frighteningly just six weeks away now. Um, I remember all too well when we were thinking about putting in a bid to host COP26, uh, which was a few years ago now. Um, and of course, we had the inevitable delay last last year. Uh, so yeah, you know, so we did put a bid in. Uh, you know, we won it, uh, but then we had the, the inevitable delay last year. Uh, but now it's literally we're just a few hours away. Um, it's such an important moment. It's a crucial moment, in fact. You know, to to really test test the UK. Let's be honest, to test the UK's commitment, uh, but also the global commitment to to really tackle uh, the problems uh, along the way. That along the way bit is really crucially important. It's vital. It's not just about 2050. Every gram counts now, as I'm sure you know, the science isn't in dispute any longer, if it ever was. We can see all around us here in the UK, uh, you know, the impacts that climate change is already having on us. Um, so it's not just on us to deliver the plan as we've set out. That should be the bare minimum effort. Actually, we should be turbocharging the things that we've set out uh, in, the, in the transport decar plan. Um, if you if you're here now over lunchtime, you know as part of this network, but I'm sure that you're following the net zero debate in in the press as it's been over the last few weeks and, and months. And I'm sure it's going to heat up, uh, you know, in, as we run up to COP. Um, and you'll know just how difficult this is across the entire economy to deliver this. It's technically difficult, um, but it's su supremely politically different as well. Um, 
But what I, what I always try to do, um, I think it's okay to be scared sometimes when you, when you look at the news and, and worry, uh, but I always keep in my mind that decarbonised transport is actually more efficient transport. Uh, it's less harmful transport and is ultimately better transport for people. And so I keep that in my mind uh, when, when I, you know, to make sure that we uh, keep on track uh, and keep everybody uh, heading towards the same goal. Um, you know, decarbonised transport can, can improve air quality from today's levels. It can cut noise pollution, uh, it can cut congestion. We can use it to cut congestion. We can improve the health of the nation as well if we get this right. And of course, really importantly, uh, to the government's levelling up agenda, uh, yeah, we can we can create jobs. We can create new uh, green, uh, high quality jobs. Um, the cost of inaction, I think let's let's put this on the right. The cost of inaction is far higher than the cost of, of sorting this out now. Uh, and I don't I don't uh, take the view that it is too late. And uh, I don't, don't share that view. So I just want to run through a bit of the transport decap plan and, and then finish off with some specifics around, around kind of hydrogen. Um, so let's start with roads. Uh, you know, that's the biggest chunk of carbon emissions uh, that we've got in transport, 90% in fact. Um, I never held the view that electric cars alone were going to save the world, let alone save the UK. Um, so we've now got a 2040 backstop, as announced in the, in the plan, for, for the sale of all road vehicles, all polluting new road, road vehicles. Uh, by polluting, I mean tailpipe emissions in that context. It's the first time any country set that out, and I'm really delighted that we've been able to do that ahead of, uh, ahead of COP26. The strongest platform that we can build uh, as we ask others to do more is to, is to rep represent ourselves as, uh, as being the very vanguard of, of ambition around this. Um, so we're talking about the smallest moped to, to the largest truck. There's nobody left out. Uh, the backstop's 2040 for absolutely everything. Um, but, but clearly, uh, some markets and some vehicle segments are, are further forward than, than others. Uh, so cars and vans, for example, all new cars and vans sold in the UK uh, will be fully zero emission at the tailpipe by 2035. It's hugely ambitious. It's not that far away, uh, but it's fundamental. And if we can't do that, then we can't decarbonise transport, frankly. But already, after bringing that date forward from 2040 to 2030, we're seeing new investments already being sparked here in the UK, whether it's in EV uh, production, uh, announcements at Ellesmere Port, for example, and in Nissan as well, or whether it's battery production. Uh, and those, those announcements come with jobs, uh, which is fantastic. We do need infrastructure. Of course we do. Uh, but that's come in as well. You know, And so we're now seeing average statistics that there are 500 charge points being added uh, to the UK network uh, each month. Uh, and really, really importantly, hundreds of those uh, tend to be rapids. Now, 2040 as a backstop, you know, may, may not sound, it depends on your perspective, but it might not sound uh, like a long way away. Uh, but let's come on to hydrogen. Let's talk about trucks. You know, we don't yet know whether trucks are going to need hydrogen refueling stations or whether they're going to need rapid battery chargers or overhead wires, perhaps, uh, or whether they'll actually, actually need to rely on a network of all three. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do right now to understand the future infrastructure needs uh, and then get it rolled out and get it in place in time so that the fleet can transition. Um, so that's why we're already active on there. We've got teams um, designing trials that could begin as early as next year, looking at how you put this zero emission technology into onto UK roads and put it into practice, basically. So overhead catenary, for example, and stretches of, of UK roads uh, and get the technology into operation in UK businesses. So we're spending 20 million, the government is, is spending 20 million pounds on that this year. It's a significant investment, um, but, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try and sit here and suggest that, um, that we don't need much more to really, really test that on a mass scale over the coming years. And so we're really working hard on, a, on, on that business case uh, to share with our colleagues in, in Treasury as we approach the spending review this year to, to really make the case that this intervention here uh, is really needed. And it is vital that we get on with it now. There's no time to wait. Um, because uh, alongside the decarbonisation plan, we consulted on uh, what would be the right end of sales date for new non-zero emission uh, trucks. So, as I mentioned, we've got 2040 as a backstop, but probably some vehicles can go earlier. Uh, 2040 feels, are, on the basis of where technology is and where businesses and where manufacturers are, 2040 feels about right for the largest trucks right now. Um, but technology moves fast. Uh, and so if you look down towards the lower weight categories, and of course the categories of vehicles for commercial vehicles are particularly wide, maybe you don't need to wait that long for seven and a half ton 
trucks, 12 tonne, 18, 26. So we've proposed actually that we split this, this category uh, into at least two. And so that we have uh, 2035 as an end date for, for vehicles that are uh, less than 26 tonnes, essentially. Now, is that right? Should it, be, should it be faster? Should it be slower? Should it be different? Uh, if you've got a view, I hope you've either shared it with us as part of the consultation, uh, but please feel free to, to tweet, LinkedIn, email, message me, uh, do, whatever it, do, do whatever it is to make sure that um, you know, I, I, I've got your views uh, and can take them into account because it's, it's so important that we get this right. Uh, this isn't just about creating headlines. This isn't just about creating noise around this. Uh, this is genuine, serious ambition, and we need to deliver on it, and we need to get it right. So alongside the transport decal plan as well, uh, we published a green paper of regulatory options, um, setting out how we can use regulation uh, to deliver these phase updates for cars and brands. Uh, and in that, we put in that our preferred option would be to see a ZEV mandate. So that's like a sales quota type of approach. Um, so there's no suggestion in there that we are banning uh, engines, for example, or any type of technology, or favouring one type of technology over another. Uh, we're not saying that the, the solution has to be batteries, which is a challenge uh, that I'm sure uh, will come into questions uh, after this. You know, but my view uh, and the view of the, of the plan that we've published just said that it looks like batteries are going to be able to do a really good job in an awful lot of places in transport. And that's particularly true as we look into road transport. That doesn't mean there's no role for hydrogen. We're really, really clear. Uh, it's stated very clearly in the document that hydrogen, um, you know, it, first of all, it must be green. Okay, so we do use the term green hydrogen throughout, uh, which is going to be in high demand across the economy. Um, so we, you know, we we do think that, uh, that green hydrogen is going to be essential for those places that batteries can't reach. So definitely a role. Potentially the most crucial role, actually, uh, you know, decarbonizing, decarbonizing all those really hard to hard to reach bits, those heavy duty transport applications, trucks, ships, planes, uh, filling in gaps on the on the railways, for example. Uh, I think that's that's our, our our view of where we where we see uh, the role for hydrogen. Um, so to start our start our journey on that path, we. We just last month announced two and a half million pounds worth of, of R&D competition winners uh, in the Tees Valley uh, in, alongside, uh, you know, to, to go into place in, in front of our uh, hydrogen transport hub that we've been setting up there. It's a really, really important first step. It might be a small first step. Uh, that sum of money might be dwarfed in comparison to others, but it's an essential first step. Get some transport applications using hydrogen underway in a region, not just in isolation, really looking at how they can play their part in building the hydrogen economy in the UK, uh, but specifically in that region of the Tees Valley. Uh, this week, we announced uh, another 55 projects, uh, which is a huge number. Um, on, on Maritime, it was uh, London International Shipping Week, which very much had a, a green uh, emphasis uh, on it this time. Uh, but many of those projects are looking to use hydrogen uh, as part of their, as, a, as an energy carrier and as part of the propulsion system. So if you haven't seen that or checked out some of those projects, uh, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, even though we, obviously, even though I'm here talking about to, to use the hydrogen network, then, uh, you know, I just wanted to put in a couple of other points around the transport decarbonisation plan, really. Uh, a key, key theme in that is moving people away from cars and onto public transport. Um, as well as encouraging people uh, or supporting people to make a lot more of the shorter journeys uh, by using active travel, so cycling or walking. Um, that's, that's really a vital key to, to unlock improvements in congestion, as well, of course, as delivering uh, for the climate uh, and the wider environment. Uh, what that will do is that will leave more space on our congested roads for those that actually need to, actually need to drive and actually need to use them. Um, so, so the decamp plan does come with restatements of uh, pretty significant investments uh, in cycling and walking, uh, two billion pounds for cycling, uh, for example. And over the last twelve months, in just the last twelve months, we've got we've got I think we've registered over three hundred infrastructure new infrastructure projects, putting in safer space for cyclists uh, just in the last twelve months, which is really really good, and we're really really proud of. Uh, big investments in buses too. Uh, not technology specific, so hydrogen, battery, but, you know, uh, the key really is uh, zero emission. So there will be 4,000 new zero emission buses hitting the UK roads in the next couple of years. But 
beyond that, this is not just a technology challenge. Uh, it, coming with that comes a pledge to reform the industry, essentially. Uh, we can't ask people or, or tell people to, to use buses unless they're more reliable, unless they're more frequent. Uh, and unless, frankly, that it's, it's a more modern service that, that, that you are being offered. Um, so it's important that we get that aspect right as well. And I think as I start to kind of uh, wrap up on my thoughts, uh, a challenge often uh, put to, to me uh, and certainly definitely to uh, ministers when we talk about uh, climate change and net zero and decarbonisation is that we are technology optimists. Uh, frankly, I don't mind that, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, and I sit here uh, and I'm reasonably comfortable with it. Um, I think the prospects for developments in clean technologies between now and 2050 are, are, are huge uh, and crucially in transport. We, we're, we're lucky, I feel, because you know a lot of the technology that, that we are going to rely on, we already know about. We don't need to reinvent batteries. Uh, we've got really good prospects now in the UK with the hydrogen strategy for green hydrogen. Uh, to come and fill in the gaps where hydrogen needs to, to play a role. Certainly, this is looking from a transport perspective. Hydrogen clearly has a wider role to play across the wider economy. Um, so as well, you know, filling in those gaps, but also, in, you know, as I've said, in the bigger applications, the heavier transport use cases, such as aviation and, and maritime, uh, which can, you know, which can get to zero. Let's uh, let's let's drop the net bit for a little while. They can these technologies can get us to zero, and they can get us there by 2050. That offers us a huge opportunity. Uh, we're so good at this technology. We're so good at, 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 at uh, innovation, you know, uh, and these are truly global markets that we're potentially going to be able to not just compete in, but to lead. Um, so to, to, to generally round up now, you know, every gram of carbon counts, so we can't just wait until 2050. We do need to see behaviour change alongside all of this. And I think for me, that's the bigger challenge as we look to a decarbonised transport system. The it's a bigger challenge than delivering sufficient volumes of green hydrogen uh, or the improvements that we would like to see in battery performance as well. Uh, so with that, I think I will close and say, you know, this, this plan, uh, I hope you've had the opportunity to, to, to look at it, uh, to read it, hopefully. Uh, it is a bit lengthy, but uh, hopefully it's a good read. Um, but this is the very, very first step. Um, and it's really important that we keep our plans as, as we've laid out under review checking that we are in line with what's not just needed across transport, but making sure that transport is playing its full part uh, in line with the rest of the economy and understanding what happens uh, in other areas of the economy. Um, okay, so, and it's really important that we, uh, yeah, keep on top of it, but as I said at the start, kind of turbocharge our efforts uh, to decarbonise transport. So that was all I wanted to, those were all my key points so far. I hope that was okay. Interesting, uh, relevant, I hope. I, as I said, I'm really looking forward to some, some tough questions. Thanks, Bob.